the naval base and also we have the signs of uh, building a Air Force Base. Well, this is the interesting thing that it's not just about the past. It's not just about protecting what they've had. You know, many people have said that this is the strongest foothold that Russia has into the Middle East, that Syria is the strongest basis they have to build up if it they want be. to expand that. It may be. It may be. And what is interesting, uh, they are not, uh, I mean, Russia is not only supplying uh, airplanes, uh, uh, some other weapons, but they are also supplying and installing their entire craft equipment, which means that uh, this is not intended to fight Islamic State, because Islamic State has no planes. Whom they, uh, do they really want to counter there? Well, it's in Western countries who, and who Turkey. Who has planes there? That's it. That's it. And. Uh, well, what, you know, what is, are the historic connections between Ukraine and Russia, these former Soviet countries, and Syria? Because you were in Syria when they began evacuating Ukrainian civilians, so I know there are a lot of mixed marriages, right? Because Syrians yeah. had studied here and in Russia? And in Russia. A lot of uh, Syrians uh, studied uh, in Russia, in some uh, specified universities also in Ukraine, and uh, in Romania, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the former students were bringing their Ukrainian wives, or Romanian wives, or Russian wives, in thousands. Well, because I'd read thousands. about this, and this was interesting, that um, I, I believe traditionally in Syrian culture you'd, you'd pay a dowry or make some sort of payment to the family. So for people who studied and you were in Russia or in other countries, being able to have a foreign wife was maybe not only physically very attractive, but also was a way of saving some money as well. Uh, well, uh, this is in the field of guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Too much speculation. We can only speculate. But how the... Um, I'm also curious. The Russian military presence in Syria, had it, it, it was there before, uh, but uh, what has specially changed these days? How we really... You know, what is so new besides the airstrike? Uh, these days, uh, uh, well, uh, I have uh, similar sources as you do. So what I read now in the papers is, is, is that uh, they are sending some uh, uh, Marines there. Uh, maybe the, their number is not that big. And uh, uh, the general declaration is that uh, they are not going to uh, be involved in uh, uh, ground operations. Um, so that's technical stuff, serious stuff. And so far. But my also um, the question, uh, of course, some things had changed since the war had started, but how Russia had been and is perceived in Syria, probably by different uh, populations. So there was some sympathy before the whole uh, conflict had emerged, but how it all developed even during the, the, the first years. Now the whole uh, Syrian society is in shambles. And that's why we sim simply uh, ca cannot see what are the relations. Are they uh, still existing? Uh, but before, yes, Russians were quite popular there, quite popular there. Many people like them. And maybe it's uh, because they, that their younger years were related to Russia. Mm. And uh, so they remember Russia when they remember their youth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or those people who studied and then that. Yeah. But it seems changing because, I mean, we've also seen in areas hit by Russian airstrikes people protesting now. So it seems like that memory will be challenged, you know, pe by people who are pro Assad and who are well, working against Assad. One has to be the there Assad. in the field to feel that. But uh, uh, I think that uh, the situation can deteriorate and change for the. Completely different. Become changing all the time. Yep. All right. Well, we're so happy to have you on to give us a little more insight into the situation from your years there, and we'll hopefully have you back in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, I'd like to uh, now we would go to Moscow, uh, where we also would uh, listen to the, let's say, the explanation by the Russian journalist and expert how it's all rolling on there. And now we
we calling to Moscow to know more on Russian perspective on the adventure in Syria and we're in touch with the Russian journalist and editor-in-chief of the publication Slon True and also a presenter of TV Rain uh, to uh, answer our questions. So, Mikhail, I mean, how have we gone from 77% of Russians being against military action in Syria before, you know, we had these airstrikes beginning to now when it was uh, all of these maneuvers were approved by the Russian parliament, both houses, within one day? Uh, actually, I'm not sure we have, uh, we already have these numbers and, and, and the polls we can rely on uh, about um, Russia's public opinion on Syria's war. Uh, but... We know for sure that um, that uh, Russia's public opinion will not probably support uh, so emotionally uh, this campaign as uh, it did support the campaign, the military campaign in Ukraine, uh, because uh, because Syria is far away. Um, uh, is uh, what is called ours. Uh, I would say, and for, uh, about Syria, nobody knows uh, for sure what, what it is and where it is and who is Al-Assad and what is, it, what, is it all, what is it all about. And Mikhail, we have read um, in different articles in Russia that there is a support of the uh, Russian political elite of this airstrike uh, Russia is conducting in Syria. So how it's uh, really perceived and what does Russian governmental channels do that? What is their tone uh, explaining Syria and Russian involvement there? Yes. Uh, the, the first uh, the first point is that there is no political elite. There is just one decision. And uh, when decision is made, um, the political um, elite just stands behind. And that's, that's it. Um, we understand that there are few, um, few goals that uh, Russia was following during this uh, Syria campaign. Um, and they probably contradict one another. One was to return to the global scene, the first one. Uh, and break the isolation, which was brought by the West with uh, uh, sanctions and then after the Ukraine war. Uh, the second definite uh, is, was and still is to support al-Assad, uh, who is probably the closest Russia's ally in the region. Uh, the third, probably to draw public opinion uh, in Russia, uh, from Ukraine, which is, um, and this call was accomplished for the moment. And the fourth, I don't know, just probably just to keep doing something, because uh, 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 Russian politics is constructed in a way now that you always have to do something. And uh, if you're not active in Ukraine, as Russia was not um, already, then it has, it, Russia had to to go for something else, and that was, and that was Syria. So this was sort of a multitasking. And what has been the role of Russian civil society? I mean, it's been shocking. We've had the Russian Orthodox Church, which called Putin's actions in Syria and the fight against terrorism a holy war. How have they been responding, and have they been effective at all? Uh, yes, with the beginning of uh, uh, the war in Donbass, Ukraine, even earlier, with um, the beginning of the Crimea campaign, what, a year and a half ago already, um, uh, Putin and, uh, Putin and uh, the Kremlin, um, surprisingly for themselves, found out that the war is extremely effective in building, in mobilizing uh, the society to stand behind you. And this, this, the war proved so effective that uh, the, they assumed I guess, that uh, in engaging in, in the war is the, um, the um, is where you cannot lose, actually. And that's why propaganda, which is, uh, uh, and if we're talking about Orthodox Church, supporting the war, the holy war against ISIS now, or the government, or uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or uh, Parliament, they are all like branches of the, the same uh, political organism, which is called Putin or the Kremlin, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, they all now serve the same thing of explaining why Russia is again 
involved now directly in the most probably the most complicated and most bloody armed conflict in of the 20th century 21st century uh, in the Middle East so something what even even Soviet leaders didn't do on on this scale and uh, Mikhail, in this regard, how the West, the United States, and particularly some of the European countries are portrayed uh, in uh, their actions in, in Syria, are they uh, shown as an allies? Are any discussions about some cooperation and the uh, joint uh, military operation in Syria, especially knowing that uh, the West is supporting the position to the uh, Syrian leader while the Russia, uh, while the Kremlin uh, supports Bashar al-Assad? Uh -huh. Of course, uh, of course, television propaganda softened its uh, tone uh, talking about uh, West uh, during this new stage, new uh, new campa campaign in Syria, because uh, formally speaking, um, Russia is asking uh, the West, the world, to join the grand coalition to fight global terrorism. But uh, basically, this is a very good question because it it. Uh, goes into the core of the dilemma, the main question that nobody uh, actually has to uh, right now about Russia's involvement in Syria. Even probably Putin does not. Which, uh, and the question is, is Russia actually uh, there to help the West and build this global uh, coalition to fight global terrorism, ISIS? Or it's, it puts folks in wheels uh, to the Western efforts to do whatever they whatever they intend to do uh, in, in 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 this region. All right, well, we'll have to end it there. But thank you so much. All right, so now we want to pivot to a slightly different direction. We want to take a closer look at the work of the Normandy Quartet, who also met this week. Now, for people who don't know, that includes France, Germany, Ukraine, and Russia. And it's really focused on the Minsk Agreement. So what they had decided this week uh, is that they agreed that once the Ukrainian parliament passes a, this law on the special status for Donbass, that then within 80 days, new local elections are supposed to take place. Place. This was significant because rebel authorities were proposing other dates when local elections were occur, and this was really pinned down. Ukraine, however, really stuck to their position. They said that the Minsk process cannot carry into 2016. So they want all of this resolved before the end of the year. And uh, there was a lot of talks uh, here in Kiev, and ju just not in Kiev, what it all means, because there was a, a plan which uh, kind of popped up a week ago, planned by the French diplomat uh, Pierre Morel, who was the chairman of the working group on the political affairs of the trilateral group, uh, which went a bit uh, differently than the peace agreement in Minsk. It was on ceasefire, on the amnesty, on the different kind of the elections. So there were much, uh, a lot of rumors and the discussions. Uh, what is it treason? What is not? Is it good for Ukraine? Is not? Uh, is it go? Does it go against the Ukrainian constitution? So we tried out to uh, to discuss all that and want really to explain it for you. And as Natalia had just said, all of this is very complicated. <laughs> for the complicated stuff, we like to have people into the studio to try and explain it to us and bring it together. To that extent or to that end, we have Andrei Hertel, who's with us today, who is a professor of political science at the Kiev Mohilo Academy. Thank you for joining us. Um, first question, what's new here and what matters from this most recent meeting? Yeah, I think... Um from our, from an expert's point of view, there are not so many new things. Um, we uh, usually, if we look at the uh, implementation of peace agreements, uh, we look at uh, the negative peace or the stopping measures taken to stop the hostilities, and we are looking at uh, positive peace, um, so meaning um, uh, any measures uh, uh, which will lead us to a significant improvement of the situation, uh, to the, an end of the war and to reconciliation. Uh, if I look at the really pragmatic uh, pragmatic results... Uh, of we don't really this, have either um, of those, not new ones, uh, right? Well, I mean, there, there is a little uh, movement on the side of, the, of negative peace, I would say. I would mm -hmm. say that... Uh, what, what we have achieved uh, is um, a little bit more clarity on the withdrawal of, uh, uh, of light weapons also, uh, a 
uh, on uh, the clearing of minefields. Um, but uh, one really has to say um, what's obvious is the lack of any uh, kind of progress on positive peace uh, measures mm -hmm. here. Yeah. I mean, it seems clear that, you know, it seems like a checking in, you yeah. know, that it's kind of, this is what's supposed to happen, yeah. that didn't quite work, which in a way True. is how it's supposed to True. work, but yeah. on, in another way, it's just not quite clear how quickly it could move yeah. forward. And the really big question, you know, is whether or not these amendments would be passed, creation yeah. of the special status, and yeah. whether the election would actually take place then yeah. in Donbass. Yeah. yeah, I mean, everything is basically related uh, to status questions, uh? and um, this is the most uh, important issue here at stake. And, um, we have to make sure, uh, or it has to be uh, clearly understood, that uh, this is a secessionist conflict. And secessionist conflicts, they're indivisible. They're zero-sum conflicts. Either the secessionists and Russia, they get uh, a de facto state, they get recognition, or they do not get, and Ukraine gets full political control. Now, is it a secessionist um, conflict, or is yeah. it a proxy war? Or, or do those two, well, can they overlap? Uh, it's a, in, in general, I would say it's a secessionist conflict, but of course, uh, it is a, f a form of imported separatism. But for an little purpose, I, I wouldn't say that this, this really matters here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the really important aspect uh, here is uh, if one understands this uh, kind of logic of uh, indivisibility, so only one side can win, uh, uh, we have to understand that we can change basically uh, the, whole, the whole setup uh, only um, by uh, kind of context-related measures. Uh, so we have to really look at how the situation develops, and this is what is done on the international side, on the Ukrainian side, everyone is looking at each other right now. Mm. Um, they look how the other side moves. Is the other side showing signs of weakness, um, uh, which would pertain, allow oneself uh, uh, to go ahead uh, with, with, a pro uh, with a more kind of progressive proposal? Well, um, how does Syria factor into yeah. those evaluations? I and mean, is that changing the policy of Western yeah. countries? Well, it, it has, uh, especially on the West, I think it has a, uh, it has a lot of significance. Um, from the Ukrainian side, uh, the, uh, uh, the most, uh, the best thing would be if the West wouldn't concentrate, they wouldn't establish any connection between the, the Donbas, uh, the Ukrainian crisis, and, and Syria. But um, in, in, in reality, in politics, uh, in world politics, this does not happen. Of course, the West combines all, uh, um, uh, uh, all political fields, all issues uh, with each other. And of course, uh, the Syria crisis and uh, its very bold kind of intervention, the very bold intervention of uh, Vladimir Putin gives uh, a certain leverage on uh, the Ukrainian question. Um, so. like Try to be more concrete yeah. and understand what could yeah. be tangible. There was this plan, uh, Pierre Morel fl yeah. plan. Uh, nothing, not everything had worked. Maybe yeah. you would really. We have here on this uh, graphic their yeah. particular position. So um, coming back, maybe you would explain what really tangible from that. What really could happen? Because and what is really discussed uh, for your knowledge and what could be possible? Yeah. Well, what's what's really discussed is uh, the elections, the time of elections, and. Um, well, uh, it's general setup. Uh, either they are uh, elections are done uh, kind of separately, uh, not acknowledged by the Ukrainian side, or they are in some way or the other uh, acknowledged. This is what the morale plan uh, uh, is about. Uh, they are acknowledged by the Ukrainian side. They are kind of um, uh, they are done and, and, and uh, uh, legally done by Ukrainian law. Um, and uh, but then the question would be uh, if they are also organized. Um, uh, uh, on, uh, on the behalf of the Kiev authorities. But uh, what I heard, and yeah. I, tr I, I try to, we at Hromatsky try yeah. to speak to so different different yeah. groups, people in Washington, people yeah. in Brussels, yeah. or elsewhere, and also different kind of yeah. MPs and politicians in Ukraine. Mm. So they see that there is a, some kind of uh, contradiction that the West, let's say, yeah. sees the election as kind of the end game. There are yeah. the election, and Minsk is for fulfilled, yeah. while the official Ukrainian side says, no, it's just a control over the Ukrainian-Russian border. That is a story, and this election, it can't be considered as any kind of, uh, you know, result. 
does this election. So what would be your take on that? Of course. Well, my take on that is I'm, I'm very critical here on the Western position um, because um, what I would, uh, under the current circumstances, um, kind of recommend uh, Western leaders, Western authorities, is um, uh, to take it easy uh, and to not, to not rush any sanctions, uh, uh, any, sorry, uh, um, any status-related uh, questions. Uh, because uh, what, what I think here is um, that um, what, what, what we see basically in Russia is um, that Russia now wants to get rid of the problem. Uh, of course, it wants a de facto recognition um, uh, for uh, the separate leaders, but it wants to drop out. Um, it wants to get uh, um, everything out. Of, it wants to get the problem off the table, basically. Yeah? That means it is in a rush. Yeah? It could even mean that the sanctions approach of Western leaders um, are working. Yeah? And uh, I think the, the, the worst thing you can do in such a situation is rush with any status-related questions. Yeah? Just wait how the situation develops. Um, I do not think um, uh, that, or I do think that time is running out for this very bold strategy of Vladimir Putin. Yeah? If we look at all the indicators, um, economic indicators, um, uh, then uh, I really think uh, that Russia is not um, on the winning side here, although it gives the impression uh, and this is uh, this is always uh, um, the thing. It gives it, it, it's engaged in signaling. Um, Russia likes to look like a winner, yeah, no matter what's is, happening. That it looks like the winner, that it is the first mover here. But effectively, what we see in the Donbas is that uh, a big part of the strategy of Vladimir Putin hasn't worked, and now he wants to get uh, 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 the issue off the table. Um, he wants uh, um, a fast settlement, uh, and this is what the West should not rush Ukraine into right now. It should wait. Which makes sense. I mean, it will have lasting repercussions yeah. moving forward. But I think you're right. There's some people who would see it as a very limited opportunity to try and get things done. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and uh, look forward to speaking to you in the future. And yes. the, what we would like to bring to you is another story. Just um, what I'd like to show is that just to remind that how this map of conflict looks like. So we still have this separation line between uh, Donba, uh, between uh, two different uh, regions in uh, Donetsk, uh, in Donbas region, Donetsk and Luhansk. So uh, before we also going and to listening how the whole situation is seen from uh, Donetsk with people coming to our studio, uh, please watch a report uh, from this town. I try to, to show it somewhere. Just a frontline town. Our correspondent went there to have a look at what is the life there. There are the main industrial enterprise just on this called separation line, uh, which was heavily bombarded. And if there is any idea, it would be rebuilt and how people feel about that. At this point of view, please watch. Все устали от войны и все надеются, что то перемирие, которое сейчас есть, может перерасти в мир. Война, которая идет между людьми, говорящими на одном языке, в стране, где никогда не было религиозных конфликтов. Но я не мог даже предположить, что в Украине можно разжечь такой конфликт. Эту войну начали политики, они ее должны закончить. Чем занимаемся? Работаем. Страх, естественно, есть, присутствует, как у нормального, у любого адекватного человека. Одеваться некуда, так как все-таки родился в Авдеевке, всю жизнь прожил с осознанную. Ну, в принципе, зарплата, естественно, тоже держит. Потому что ехать некуда здесь, и родители живут, и жена здесь же работает. И уезжал на месяц, это было в феврале месяце этого года. Ну, вернулись, а куда? Когда здесь было попадание, у нас, слава богу, не было здесь никого. Мы уже успели закончить смену и уехать. Мы об этом узнали, в принципе, из интернета. И на следующий день, когда приехали на работу. Конечно, для всех было шоком то, что такое попадание. И... Ну, страшно вообще-то было. То, что мы смогли своими силами, мы все это сделали, убрали, привели в порядок для того, чтобы цех все-таки мог функционировать. Мы прекрасно знаем, что завод без нашего цеха не может обойтись, потому что мы ремонтники, малейшее какое-то что-то, мы нужны здесь. Поэтому мы знали, что это нужно, это наш завод, а 
завод – это наш город фактически, потому что без завода города не будет. of the uh, responsible citizens, which is based in Donetsk and since the first day of the conflict had been working with delivering humanitarian aid, organizing this humanitarian aid. This group had never left Donetsk during the whole time of war, uh, driving sometimes between Kyiv and Donetsk, and uh, we rarely have the people from the, let's say, occupied the, te the territories under the separatist control here in the studio. So. Uh, Definitely the first question. Um, you know, I think you also followed the news, what would be happening with what had happened in Paris, how these deals are uh, negotiated, what are the results, and how it seems from Donetsk. Are there the hope, are there the feeling that this is the end, or uh, how the, what the people think, and what is your, you know, analysis? Great, thank you very much. Definitely the great hope. And that hope became much bigger after the Paris meeting because the first small hope was born after the first uh, critical ceasefire, which was uh, managed by both sides more than three weeks. People are coming back. So basically what we are talking now, that the 3.5 million who are living at that territory, plus 750 those who are living between uh, Donetsk and other Ukrainian cities, now uh, we approximately calculating that 40% out of the total some those who left the region from the very beginning of the conflict, they're coming back. So definitely people are trying to prepare themselves for winter, to try to fix mm -hmm. their houses, especially uh, those districts of Donetsk and the small mining settlements who suffered mostly after the shelling. But what's the mood on the ground? Because if people are coming back, you know, they're hopeful, but at the same time there isn't much work for people, you know, the ATMs aren't working, so how, how are they viewing that? You're absolutely right, there is no much work, but there is the huge amount of work with their own properties. Mm -hmm. uh, those, uh, first of all, uh, let me be absolutely clear, the majority of the people of uh, Donbass, they get not used to live on the humanitarian aid. They need and want to work, and they need this work, and they want mm -hmm. to work. So that's, I foresee, as the major problem in the future. Um, but at the same time, uh, now the priority list is to fix at least one room within your flat or house, which would be um, reasonably good for winter. Mm -hmm. uh, second, food. Third, the basic electricity, water, and the medical stuff. But uh, Marina, the whole discussion here is about this forthcoming election right. and how it would work, because especially in the West, there is so much concentration on that, how it would work. Uh, so uh, is it possible? Are the election uh, coming? There was the news about the election on the 18th of uh, October, I mean the elections by the separatists. Um, I don't know about what are the plans of the rebel groups which occupied uh, the power in Donbass, but I do know a lot about the priorities of the ordinary people and civilians people in Donbass, and that's not the election definitely. Because people, for instance, uh, they are looking at the billboard and they don't know who is that person, because the priority is where to buy the cheaper bread, food mm -hmm. and drugs. The priority list is absolutely different. So I don't know anything about the election and participation and desire to participate. Mm -hmm. But I think that election in any case, if they will be in, within the matrix or framework of the Minsk or Paris Agreement, it is much better than having sh heavy shelling during the one and six months. When how, I'm just trying to, you know, people on the outside, they're trying to understand what's changing because they have this image of Donbass and they yeah see fighting and they see all of that and the issue is the whole time all of this has been going on things have been changing so have the conversations people have been having on the street or with their friends change you know from a month or two ago or are they the same what's that like I think that conversation basically are changing towards to reconciliation, towards to the future, towards mm -hmm. to those things which normally, even six months ago, we would not be uh, uh, brave enough to pronounce. Because those are luxuries.
luxuries. Yeah. I mean, if you're trying to survive, you don't talk about the of, future of in the course. same way. But what I will tell you uh, this winter, because I was very afraid of the second winter, and I, uh, I'm telling even now that this winter, for those who are staying in Donbass, will be with the ethos uh, achieved through endeavor. Mm. Because we are not ready. But why? Because there's a shortage of coal? What uh, else are the uh, other the, issues? Because a lot of issues, but if you remember, several, uh, for several months the humanitarian missions activities were blocked. Yes. And the major uh, help was not delivered in time. Basically, well, is, we that being, is that being felt? Because now the UN has been kicked out as well, no, correct? No, 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 no. Everything was lobbied, properly fixed, and now everybody is uh, working and accredited. Since when? So what was since, the period? Since, uh, since three... Uh, days ago, everything is more or less okay. But what was, before, the what was before there was, for the, what was this gap with the humanitarian uh, aid? The gap was about almost three months. So there was no humanitarian no. aid coming. Why? No. Uh, because DPR people decided to create uh, or, or to institutionalize uh, the authority and to create the committee where they to understand who is working on their territory. Uh, normally, uh, the uh, those people, they are copying the worst practices from the previous party of region elite, and they created a huge amount of the bureaucracy. Um, you've uh, come up to that topic. So there were a lot of talks about, you know, institutionalizing oh, the yeah. uh, Donetsk people, yes. so these self-proclaimed republics, and uh, many, even like the foreign journalists who've been there, and we also working said that, you know, like, it's already kind of a separate state like Transnistria. Is it there uh, like that? Do you have this feeling? Uh, first of all, I, um, um, I probably might be rude saying that something like transistry is not suitable at all because we would never survive as transistry. And I think that institutionalization of those people who were left for more than one and seven months is inevitable, Natalia. If you will not pay attention, if you will not interact with the group of people, not talk even to the civilians, people are they naturally born for self-organization. And if those people do have the support and proper weapons and so on and so forth, definitely they will self-organize. So how, do you see it in general as a frozen conflict? Do people expect it to be a frozen po po conflict? So what do you see? You live in Donetsk. What would be your life in Donetsk uh, after, you know, even if we uh, expect that there is no fire, but it's still not integrated back into the into is Ukraine? In, uh, I can't even imagine what kind of life would face more than four already million people of that territory if we are not, not going to reintegrate that part of uh, Ukraine into Ukraine. It is just impossible. This territory will not survive. It is not the transistor. We do not have the agriculture on that territory. We will not be able to feed our people. It is just impossible. That scenario, of, of course, if we are talking... But everybody speaks about this particular oh, scenario. Look, uh, we've discussed with you many times that the majority uh, of people who are from the expert communities, they're extremely uh, intellectual and very clever. But in order to do the analysis, you have to have the real data, information from, uh, the from, the ground. from the ground in order to do the proper forecast. How on earth... Tell me, we could be transistory if the all agricultural lands are on our Ukrainian side and the small piece of the land where we can, let's say, I don't know, uh, to do, uh, to, to grow anything, there with mines. So uh, the uh, very um, common question then would be, so um, what could, you know, Moscow do, what can Kiev do, what can international community to do with, uh, for, uh, you know, you working as a volunteer and probably there are some needs to fulfill. Of course. Uh, I mean that, uh, you know, everybody should do his or her or their work properly. That's my opinion. The chair politics and expertise, that's one level. The people diplomacy, that's another level. But the conversation of the civilians from the occupied territory with the civilians who are uh, on that land, that's the only way, according to my personal opinion, to reintegrate 
back Donbass and the role of media is critical now because I think that media is responsible a lot uh, for now at this stage especially how to manage the hate speakers how to launch the new trend of reconciliation, some peacemaking process, some best practices. Because the previous speakers were telling about the uh, different format of agreement, but during the last 20 years, there were 30, 36 conflicts, almost uh, the same sort of conflict we have in Donbass, and 34 of them uh, finished with the peace agreement. So maybe we were not uh, working hard enough. I do believe that now we have the uh, opportunity window and we have to use it. We can't just say, okay, we'll, goodbye Crimea, goodbye Donbass, and goodbye all four million people of Donbass. It just, uh, we just cannot afford ourselves to do that. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Marina. So that was a point of view from um, Donetsk, which is under the separatist control. And uh, before going also to listening to the official positions, we also would like you to see what is the life there. And we do have the report from the Opetnaya. It's a village just also very, very close to Donetsk. On the separate, uh, we call this territory the Grey Zone. It also had to be taken seriously where there are not really any kind of authorities. Neither the separatists nor really government. Uh, it's not really fully on the government control. So uh, how do people live there? Please, that's a video from us. Нет, 58 лет, мне 55, и Порошенко запретил мне выдавать пенсию до 58 лет. Дальше что мне теперь я делать? Говорю, вот я вернулась сюда. Вот всем скажите, приезжайте к нам на опыт, у нас все очень да, хорошо. Мне, мне не дали пенсию, потому что с 58 лет. Кто, ну ладно, вы не будете кто, это кто сказать. Кто-то зараз повертается на люди. Ну, кто повертается? Раз... Никто не, не повертается. Кушайте. Мы ездим Нет. на велосипедах за хлебом, нас за кормят солдаты. Да. И ну раз да, хлеба нету, солдаты нам дают, им тоже хлеба нету, не везут. Ну, Они нас не нас трогают, нету, да, не да. обижают, помогают да. нам, да. Да вот собаки у нас, вот одна, вторая, да. Но в основном я живу с котом, да. Он тоже всего боится. Меня заставила уехать, потому что перебили 31 января газ и свет. А воды нету у нас еще с мая месяца 14 года. 1 февраля уехала на Львов. Снимают квартиру, и я уехала к ним. Я вернулась 22 марта со Львова. И все, я тут вот обитаю. Мы ожидаем, что это все... И будет точно так же работать, и как-то мы, может, работу найдем. Мне 45 лет. Мне 45 лет. Я же думаю, что я еще что-то где-то найду. Я надеюсь... Ну, я, конечно, мало верю, но я все равно надеюсь. Хлеб нам солдаты дают. Это польский хлеб. хлеб да. Вот. Вы берете верхнюю оболочку, снимаете вот эту, а вот это остается, и вы микроволновку ложите на 5 минут, и он разбухает, и получается... Или Или... А на вкус какой? Вот попробуй, а как ржану, как типа... Uh, now we have uh, Svetlana Zelishuk, who is a member of Ukrainian parliament from Petro Poroshenko bloc. It's a bloc of the Ukrainian president. Uh, and uh, there are much to discuss. We also would like to discuss the issue of the Ukrainians detained in Russia and expectation on that. Uh, but following the, all the discussion about the Normandy meeting, about the settlement in, uh, in, in, in Donbass made by the leaders of the four states, Silana, from you definitely you are not officials, you doesn't represent president himself, but you are a politician from his party. So how it's all seen? What are the concern? Are there any? Uh, because what I know that there is a concern that it won't be easy to pass all the laws on the special stat on this on the election in Donbas. That there is a political struggle. It's not that much uh, seen in the. Uh, there is not much information in the West by that because it's kind of uh, considered that it's all settled, Ukraine is very much satisfied with what hap what's happening. I think that this issue
issue is probably the biggest challenge for the political unit, unity uh, of Ukrainian coalition, of the parliamentary coalition at all, and for Ukrainian government in particular. And why is that? Because we know that even the voting for the first reading of the Constitution managed to divide the coalition. A radical party left it, as well as two parties from the coalition, Batkishina and also Samopomish, didn't vote for the first reading. So it, uh, it uh, raised, uh, raises the question of where is the majority for moving forward with other issues like these elections in the occupied areas. But what are the concerns? Why why there is a debate that is often not clear right so i would say i would name three main questions first is about the about the sustainability I have been listening to this program, and you asked the right question, that very often the West refers to the Minsk Agreement as if the election's done and then the conflict is over. But that's not true. And the question if, yes, let's imagine that elections took place and we have those people as a legitimate power in the East with amnesty probably sometimes criminal, sometimes very corrupt people in the power, and uh, with self-governance, which has this spatial status, right, because they will elect their prosecutors, their police, their judges. Uh, we gave them this power with the, with the particular law. And what if, after this, when sanctions are already lifted, and Russia is acknowledged to be, again, a partner, which is participating in different coalitions with regards to Iran, Syria, and so on, right? What if then um, the provocation is arranged skillfully uh, using all the, the instruments of the hybrid uh, warfare and uh, the provocation, I don't know, a murder or whatever, and it is being presented as if Ukrainian government arranged that. What, what I'm trying to say, wait a second, uh, it's, a, it's an important point, that the peace is not guaranteed with these elections in the occupied area. And then, if anything happens, in conflict is, will continue, it will be already perceived as a civic war. It will be already perceived as a conflict within the country, an internal conflict. And, uh, but the, uh, the other question is, so what is, uh, probably even not, it couldn't be your personal, but in general, the Ukrainian state, the, uh, the government policy, in order to really um, do something with these territories, you know, to fight for hearts and minds, you know, because there is, you know, when there is a fire, when there is a fight, people are fighting. But there is still this moment when there is a ceasefire. And so what, are the polit uh, what would be the uh, policy of engagement to get back these four million people which are still there in these circumstances? Uh, doesn't matter what Russia will do, because, you know, anyways, they will do something. But what is the Ukrainian strategy on that? What it could be? To be honest, I think that it hasn't been even discussed, this strategy. Moreover, I think that many things about how the conflict, what is the strategy about the conflict resolution, we hear from the statements of foreign politicians, as well as the leakage from, from the diplomats, because, for example, this Plan Morel uh, that is part of this negotiation. Why, why are your party, well, isn't your party discussing how the Ukrainian politician talk about that? Because it sounds like for somebody for, in the West as an obvious topic. Well, uh, as I said, we haven't heard about this plan from Oh, but I mean in Ukrainian general. officials, right? Yeah. We heard it from, from foreign officials. But anyway, uh, at the moment, I think, on the agenda, the real issues on the agenda that are being discussed is, first of all, is ceasefire, and second of all, is withdrawal of the weapon, and third of all, is the release of political uh, uh, prisoners. What I'm trying to say, that we didn't even get to that point of what is this strategy of the engagement and involvement and participation. Because until now, I, I think that even those three things are not, uh, hasn't been uh, ensured. So uh, they are still on the agenda. Well, I think they're, they're all good points about where it goes from there and what the process actually looks like if it goes ahead. Because as you're right, it's not a magic wand, it's not a magic step that if you get to that point, everything just magically becomes good. But we wanted to turn in a slightly different direction. Uh, as people know, the trial of Nadia Savchenko, a Ukrainian pilot uh, currently going on in Russia, has been going on this week. Now, uh, there's been a parallel trial going on here in Kiev with two alleged uh, Russian officers of military intelligence who were 
seized, and these trials have been going on together. Uh, so really, you know, one of the other issues we wanted to talk to you about is how this process is being perceived, if the two trials are connected to each other, and what the concerns are moving forward. Well, it's not up to me to to uh, to probably comment on the on the trial uh, because I'm not involved in uh, you know in the in this. Uh, You're not a party to the trial, right, obviously. Right. But uh, well, uh, you know, I uh, I just uh, came back from uh, United Nations General Assembly, and I was there together with Vera Savchenko, sister of Nadia Savchenko, and another uh, member of Parliament. Uh, yes, Nadia Savchenko is oh, member of Parliament. Yes. Yeah, Vera is her sister. Vera, she, I she's meant not. Oh, oh, she's, she's not. Oh, sorry, she's not. I'm she's not. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand, she's the candidate to some uh, on some on, during the local, local elections. Election. Right? My mistake. Yes. But. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time with her, and we were talking about so how does she feel the situation, and what is mm. her hope. And uh, from her words, I can say that uh, she actually proved, even before the Russian official, Russian Ministry for Justice, uh, released that information, uh, that she might be released after the trial already verdict. Uh, Vera told me about this before, that she feels that probably it will be solved, solved after the verdict, and they will discuss on which conditions she will be returned to Ukraine. Mm. So this is this is her hope. But yes, of course, we've heard this information that probably two trials are somehow connected. I can't comment on it really. No, I'm I was just asking because we, it. you know, last week we were looking at the situation in Estonia where there had been an yes. intelligence officer who had been captured, been convicted in Russia, and the end solution ended up being exchanged. Him, a convicted um, spy with right. someone else, who, a Russian agent who'd been convicted in Estonia. So it seems like often these court cases have to happen, and then once they're declared equals, then a change is possible. I'm sure, I'm sure that governments use this logic. But what, I'm try what I wanted to say as well, that we are discussing Nadia Savchenko case, and it's also part of the Minsk agreement, right? And it's, uh, from what I remember, number, point number six, that all political prisoners have to be released. And they had to be released already long ago, but they are not. means that uh, the the uh, the thing is that we observe a persistent non-fulfillment of the Minsk agreement from Russian side, and it's being implemented at the price of the Ukrainian government's concessions. And what I'm really worried about that these concessions can can really challenge the legitimacy of the power of the Ukrainian leadership in, of the government in Ukraine without uh, uh, sufficient support of these movements. Well, I think there's also the concern that if, if it looks like the Ukrainian government isn't getting a beneficial deal from it, if they're always giving more than they're getting, then it's a real political That's issue. That's my point. That's uh, that I would uh, also remind. So uh, currently, uh, what we know from the officials, there are 159 still um, prisoners detained in the separatist territories. There are 10 in uh, Russia, so uh, clearly in the detention either in uh, Rostov or different cities, so we also can also show you this um, graph, but it's just uh, some of you, the, here we do have these two Russian intelligence agents and just two Ukrainians, uh, but there are in general uh, 10 of them, so... Um, so uh, that that would be the um, some, some, something again to remind, uh, and um, so Svetlana, you, with with that thing. Um, how generally, so what is on stake for this, uh, you know, who are generally involved in these uh, negotiations and, uh, you know, uh, still maybe, you know, there were really these, not rumors that uh, Savchenko would be freed on by the end of the year. D or it's still the rumors. I mean, these rumors were spread all around. I mean, it's like diplomatic circles. It's not the rumors in the street. As I said, even the sister of Nadia, Vera, she believes in this scenario. But as we know, these kind of negotiations are done behind the curtain, and uh, they have to be uh, they have to be somehow silent. Otherwise, I'm afraid they cannot be uh, achieved. So, um, of course, we use. As politicians, I mean, as Ukrainian government, we raise this issue on the highest, highest level international. And President mentioned about this case during his main speech on the UN General Assembly. I, I managed to uh, to smuggle in Vera on the reception of, which was uh, given by uh, EU during UNGA. 
and uh, we met with President Tusk, with Federica Mogherini, with the uh, Swedish Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs of Sweden, and we were talking about this particular case. And they assured us that they, uh, that they guarantee that they will not leave it aside. And they, they do remember her name, you know, we didn't even tr uh, try to explain who Nadia Savchenko is. So it, people, was like a, it was like a trigger, you know. Uh, so people yeah. are still aware and Ukrainian that's, politicians are raising them the highest levels. That's for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in and sharing all of that with thank us. Thank you very much for, for this air. Um, and um, with this part, we also would like to um, discuss a bit more, uh, not just the history, but the, how history uh, could have impacted the whole perception of Ukraine. And we talked to the famous historian, one of the best on the uh, history of this part of the world, uh, the Timothy Snyder, the professor of the Yale University, author of the book Bloodlands, but currently he has published a new book on Holocaust, the Black Earth. And one of the question and one of the response, uh, an interesting one, uh, he has given how Ukraine could also work with this history uh, without basing it on the myth and anything else, but how it, Ukraine can work out. Uh, so please, Timothy Snyder at the Romatskin. Your new book is about Holocaust, and um, what's an Ukrainian context of your new book? Okay, so it's an excellent question. The book is called Black Earth, and Black Earth is meant to be a reference to the fertile soil of Ukraine, as well as to the possibility of a very dark future for our planet as a whole. The Ukrainian contexts are, are, are several. First of all, I'm trying to show that one of the causes of the Holocaust was Hitler's colonial campaign for the Black Earth of Ukraine. If Hitler didn't start a war to create a colony in Eastern Europe, the Holocaust would not have been possible because he needed the war, and the war had to take place on the lands where the Jews lived. The second Ukrainian context, of course, is what actually happens in Ukraine when German power arrives and how Soviet citizens, Ukrainians, and others react to German power. That's also a major subject of the book. There is a uh, um, small town, Berdichu, maybe you know. Uh, it was a center of uh, Jewish community in Ukraine before the uh, World War. Berdichu was a Jewish, it was a Jewish metropolis, mm -hmm. and there's a there's a whole there's a whole literature about Berdichev, and there are important writers who came from Berdichev, and it has a very very rich past in Jewish religious and in literary history. What you're asking is a general question in Ukraine and everywhere else. Um, knowing who you are is partly about knowing what came before. So Americans could do a better job knowing about what Indian settlements were there before we destroyed them. Um, Israelis can do a better job knowing about what Arab villages were there before 1948. Um, uh, Poles can do a better job knowing about what German towns were like before Germans were expelled at the end of the Second World War. And everyone in Europe could do a better job knowing about the Jewish cities and towns of Europe so this is true in Vienna, where much of the center of Vienna used to be populated by Jews, and everyone has now just forgotten that and overlooks it. And it's true most pronouncedly in Poland and Ukraine and Belarus, which is where most of the Jews lived. So I would just say generally, it's very important to know, if you want to know where you came from, you have to know what came before. And that's always painful. It's painful for everyone. I'm mainly concerned about explanation. So... That we do have many points of view, many stories, as you say, but in the West, at least, there's, a, there's an overemphasis on German and French and Western points of view, rather whether victims or perpetrators. We don't really know much about Poland or Ukraine or Belarus, and that's where the Holocaust actually took place. So I'm trying to make sure that the history is a general one, that it's a European one, and then I'm also trying to explain because I do think that we lack an explanation of how such a thing could have happened. Uh, the history of Central Europe has been considered marginal uh, and now um, becomes popular. Why? I mean, two things are happening. The first is that 
more and more Europeans understand that their history only makes sense with East European history. For a couple of generations, everyone in Europe and America was taught a kind of history of Western civilization, which was Greece, Rome, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance in Italy, uh, revolution in France, industry in England, industrial revolution in Germany, and then some wars. And that history included everyone who took part in Western integration, but it excluded the center and the east of Europe. People are slowly realizing that that paradigm doesn't make sense. But the second thing which has happened, of course, is that uh, history is so much present in the news that um, that that people have to pay some kind of attention to Ukrainian and Russian history. So, you know, when Russia claims that there is no Ukraine, no Ukrainian history, then at least some people then ask themselves the question, well, what, what, what really is Russian history and what is Ukrainian history? I use the term bloodlands in the book to describe countries that were the object of attention from the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. I, although what's happening in Ukraine now is terrible, it's not the same thing. <laughs> It's not the same thing. R Russia is not the Soviet Union. Um, Moscow doesn't control Ukraine's domestic politics. And the powers to your west are very, are very different. So, but to answer your question, what did you get wrong? Um, I think everyone knows the answer to that. The answer to that is the rule of law. Um, the rule of law is the thing which people cared about on the Maidan. The rule of law is the reason why Westerners are hesitant about investing in or helping U Ukraine. And it's not an easy thing. I mean, building a state, building a state that functions is not an easy thing. But that's, that's the most important question. I think if the, if, if the Ukrainian government can build a functioning state on the territory it controls, then the war and Donbass and Crimea will eventually solve themselves. What is the maximum of compromise uh, for, uh, for Ukrainians in the question of Donbass? That's, I'm not going to answer that. That's a question for Ukrainians. I, my general position is that the best policy for the Donbass is to reform the rest of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's also the best policy towards Russia. Um, what issues in national history Ukrainians choose to keep silent? Uh, well, I mean, there are Ukrainians who work on every difficult aspect of national history. There are Ukrainians who work on the Holocaust. There are Ukrainians who've written good books about the UPA. Um, so it's not that the Ukrainian nation as a whole is ignoring its difficult history. Um, uh, but I think probably what you need more than anything is history which which takes into account all the different points of view in the entire country, whether geographically but also Ukrainians and not Ukrainians, so the people who inhabited the territory of Ukraine. And that's, that's not so easy. That's a major challenge, but, but it has to be done. As for the question of challenging dark history, I mean, history is not always dark, but when it is dark, you have to treat it the same way. You can't treat the nice history differently than the not nice history. It's all history. You have to kind of accept it. You have to accept it all as it comes. And it's, it's for this reason that I don't, I don't like it when the Ukrainian state or any other state tells people how to carry out historical research. We had more of mythology in, in history for USSR. Uh, uh, obviously, now politicians uh, try to create a new version of uh, mythology, national mythology in history, mm -hmm. uh, on the base of the nationalism, uh, for example. Or how to transit from uh, mythology to narrative in history? M myths are good for authoritarian regimes because myths provide a, a perfect image of something which never really exists. Um, narratives are good for nationalists because narratives explain everything. But a, a, mature, a mature political nation doesn't need a myth. It doesn't even really need a narrative. It needs a history which makes sense to everyone. And that means that whether you're a Ukrainian from Zaporizhia or a Ukrainian from Zakarpatia or a Jew in Kiev or whatever it is, or a Pole in, 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 in Zhitomir, um, that the history makes sense. Not that you like it, not that you don't like it, but that it makes sense. You see where you fit into it. That's not exactly the same thing as a narrative. Um, it's, it's more of, a, it's more of a, an attempt to be inclusive. Narratives tend to leave things out. So national history is possible, and I'm sure Ukrainian historians will write decent national history. But as I say, I don't think it probably slows down the process when the government issues directives about how that should be done.
All right, so we're just about the, at the end of our program, but we want to leave you on a high note. We have an interview with uh, Professor of History Mark Van Hagen at Arizona State University and the Free Ukrainian University in Munich in Germany. So we have that for you now, but we'll say good night. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. All right, so joining us now is Professor Mark Van Hagen of Arizona State University and also the Dean of the Philosophy Department at the Free Ukrainian University in Munich. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank you, nice to be here. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is if you could just tell us a little bit about the project you're doing, um, as I understand it, it's about Ukrainian diplomats and trying to educate them through partner universities in Europe and the US. But it's not so much about just educating Ukrainian diplomats as it is about helping Ukrainian diplomats educate us in the West about Ukraine. Because one of the problems I face as a historian of Ukraine um, is uh, a constant sort of laziness or, or just ignorance on the part of even my historian colleagues who, who work on Russian Eastern Europe about Ukraine's history. And, and, and most people still sort of have an automatic default to, to Russia and Soviet Union. And, uh, and that's true. What's true for the academic world is, uh, I think, as, as true, if not more true, for the diplomatic world. So American, European diplomats, um, I don't think, are as aware of Ukraine as they should be. So, so that's one side of it. The other side of it is after the end of the Soviet Union, the Russian foreign ministry inherited all of the sort of intellectual apparatus of the Soviet foreign ministry, which means all these institutes of international relations and area studies institutes, the, the famous Institute of USA in Canada, in Moscow, all of those were in Moscow. So Kiev had a slightly a bit better situation than some of the other successor states in that they had a United Nations representative since 1944. Which is something Stalin negotiated right. for, correct? Yeah as part of the Yalta agreements and the agreements with the Churchill and, and Roosevelt. But, but that was a very small staff of 60, and, and, and they mostly only worked with the United Nations organization. So they only had multilateral uh, relations. They never had any bilateral relations. So, so Ukraine really is at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis Russia, as are the other post-Soviet states. But Ukraine, of course, is the biggest one. And I think if Ukraine doesn't succeed at what it's doing in, in getting itself put on the map again, um, the other ones don't have much hope either. So my idea was to uh, get uh, advanced, grad, advanced students in international relations and maybe beginning diplomats to spend a, a semester or a year in an American, Canadian, or European uh, university in, with international relations programs, or with some area studies institutes or diplomacy institutes. Um, Diplomatic Academy in Vienna comes to mind, uh, Georgetown in, in, in Washington, uh, and um, again, have these people from Ukraine develop relationships with counterparts in the West. Uh, a useful set of meetings with uh, some former diplomats, um, ambassadors, foreign ministers who formed the Ukrainian Foreign Policy Association, and they're very keen on hooking us up with the Kiev Institute of uh, International Relations and the Lviv Institute of International Relations and finding candidates. And my idea is to spread these Ukrainians uh, with interest in foreign relations around all sorts of, you know, everything from Stanford to Harvard to uh, Columbia to Georgetown to European universities and, and get people to know uh, that there is a Ukraine that's different from Russia, that's, you know, uh, that's got its own interests and, and that's um, worth getting to know. And I mean, these are universities that you've taught at and studied at, respectively, so that's there. I mean, what's been the response from Western partners? I mean, it seems like Ukraine is much more on the map for Western countries than it was before. What have people been saying to you in the West when you've kind of floated this idea? Some universities have already built in programs where they can assign a slot to Ukrainians, such as my university, Arizona State University, has a McCain Institute. John McCain is my senator from Arizona. And who was just in Odessa this he week. just in Odessa. He's a big... This is his third trip to Ukraine, I think, this I was told. So he's a, a very big supporter of Ukraine's independence, and uh, I, I, I was glad that his institute at my university offered the first concrete slot for a Ukrainian for next year. Uh, Georgetown, the new dean of Georgetown, the former student of mine, also very interested in this. And of course, the, my, my old home, uh, Columbia University, before I moved to Arizona, um, uh, also has Valery Kuczynski teaching there, who uh, is a former permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations, who I got a teaching uh, at, at Columbia while I was still there. 
and he uh, has put me in touch with all of these guys and, and sort of helped me work out this idea uh, that this would help uh, Ukrainian diplomatic corps uh, build, rebuild itself and, and, and build itself to a new level. Um, to turn in a slightly different direction, I know you've been looking a lot at the history of the Ukrainian People's Republic after World War I. Um, for most of the people in the West, this is completely off the radar. A lot of people don't even know that Ukraine had this brief few years of independence, um, and it's a very vivid memory for here. What I found very interesting that you've spoken about is how there's a lot that was done then that was done very well and that Ukraine doesn't need to repeat now, though it's trying to do it from scratch. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. What sort of things were done well? I guess I, I, I see that period, 1914 to 22, very similar to today right now, and where you know, there's a lot of uh, threats to Ukraine. Um, there's a Ukrainian national movement that's still uh, that's getting stronger, but that, that, that is still rejected by Russians on the one hand, at least certain kind of Russians. I wrote a paper about the Treaty of brest again, kind of a forgotten treaty on the forgotten front. Um, and the first treaty, uh, I mean, we mostly know that the Treaty of brest was signed with the Bolsheviks in March 1918. But the first treaty was signed a month earlier with the Ukrainians, with the Central, uh, with the Ukrainian National Republic, uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic. And it was negotiated by five young men none of whom had extensive diplomatic service. They all came out of the student movement and the soldiers movement of 1917. They'd all served in the Ukrainian Central Rada and the General Secretariat, so they had actually more experience than any of the Bolsheviks who showed up in brest But they didn't have diplomatic training. But they knew how to behave with the Germans and the Austrians and the Hungarians and the Turks and the Bulgarians. The Bolsheviks sent this kind of theatrical delegation of a, a terrorist who had assassinated some Ministry of Interior official and a, a sailor and a, a soldier and a worker. And the Germans and the Austrians just looked at them and said, this is a serious delegation? No. And, but the, the Ukrainians came and they wore their tucks and tails, they dressed nicely, they behaved, and they, and they made a good case. They were united against the Bolsheviks and also somewhat against the Central Powers, and they got these Central Powers, the Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Turkey, to recognize Ukraine. The fact that these five guys, who are almost all under 30, with no diplomatic experience, could you know, unite around a set of issues that they wanted to press with the Central Powers, and, and, the, and they realized the central powers were all desperate for peace. They all, there was starvation in Vienna, there was starvation in Budapest, there was riots in Berlin. So the Germans and the Austrians needed peace. The Ukrainians certainly needed peace, the Bolsheviks needed peace. And so the, the Ukrainians were very skillful at getting their state on the map for the first time uh, in a serious way. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's a good lesson that even in all that chaos and all that dissension and the divisions among Ukrainians themselves, they were able to pull together you know, when, it, when it counted. Well, I think I'm going to end you on that, but I think this idea of, you know, as difficult as everything has been, the fact that these events have gotten Ukraine on the radar of other countries and created an opportunity is a powerful message yeah. I want to keep in mind.